Is it on? Okay. I just want to welcome you all to our program this evening on scams. And we're very happy to have Jacob Hugart here. Um, he was, we were talking last summer about scams and he seemed to know a lot and he was very happy to come and tell all of us more about it. So we're happy. And he'll tell us a little bit more about it, a little bit more about himself. So welcome. Yep. Thank you very much. So, what to be aware of with scams? Everything. Memorize this packet and you're protected for life. And if you believe that, I got a bridge in Baltimore to sell you. <laughs> Seriously though, the, we'll go over this packet here just a little bit, but, um, well let me get into the presentation because I'll hit the highlights of things here and go through. So, a little something about me. I've worked in corporate IT for 30 years, and it's kind of scary to reflect on that fact. Um, my wife and I were talking the other day that it was roughly 30 years ago we first came up here on spring break to visit with a friend and ended up in a cycle that got us both jobs and moved up here very quickly. So um, it's been a while. Uh, however, my jobs have been involving with support, not IT security. So technically, I am not an expert, but I have seen this stuff, I have heard about it, and I used to do support in the University of Iowa when I was a student there, so there are things that one picks up over all that time, and of course there's lots of information online, and we'll be going over that in the handout. Uh, my first computer job actually was in high school in the 1980s, so just to give you a sense about how long I've been doing computer stuff, it's been a while. Um, I actually learned the trade before the World Wide Web existed, which for a lot of modern computer graduates is just, how could you do that? You couldn't look up stuff. It's like, yeah, we had books. They were quick reference guides. It was okay. And then, yeah, all sorts. There was ways to get that information. And I've been involved here at Fairmount since the turn of the century. Um, but yeah, most of my knowledge comes from late last century. That's always a great turn of phrase to use. And of course, I've done a bit of acting here and there. So, standing up and doing public speaking is not really a problem. If you did not grab a handout, we do have some, and there will be extras, obviously. Tell your friends, take an extra copy to give to a neighbor, anything like that. I've got a whole other box here, apart from the ones that are already over there, so please go ahead. So, let's talk about you. And... The first thing is, I'm not trying to embarrass anyone. So if you have been a victim, maybe a scenario I talk about has happened to you, you don't have to confess. <laughs> this, is, this is not 12 steps to scam recovery. You're okay, all right? It's, it's okay to keep your peace on these kind of things. You don't have to share your experiences. You are certainly welcome to ask questions at any point. Raise your hand. Let me know, this is more discussion in that sense, but I do have a bunch of information to go through and again, we'll talk about what's all in here. Um, as I said, you don't have to reveal if you fell for a scam. There's no shame because the key thing to remember is that everyone is vulnerable. There is nothing that protects you from being scammed, all right? There's no guarantee. There's nothing that I can tell you, there's nothing that I can do for myself that will prevent me from ever encountering or possibly falling for a scam. Because life is complex, lots of things happen in life. And scams change all the time. I've heard about, since preparing for all this stuff earlier this year, I have been hearing about, oh, new scam just popped. Red light cameras, text message you get saying, hey, you were caught speeding, click this link to pay your fine. It's not real, but that kind of thing comes up. People find other ways to take advantage of folks like you. So it doesn't matter if you're young or old. Age is not protecting you. In fact, there are some things that children, teenagers especially, might be more susceptible to than adults, and vice versa. And being a technical novice or a technical expert isn't protection either. It's easy to think that. It's like, oh, modern smart kids these days won't. No, they do. Um, we'll talk about one of the things that I have information on in here is 
Reddit, a social media platform, for want of a better term. There's a whole scam subreddit there, and they have lots of information. It's mostly people saying, is this a scam? Did I just fall for a scam? Lots of people fall for scams, okay? It's, it's unfortunate if it happens, but it's not a character failure. So don't beat yourself up if you realize, oh my God, I had that last summer. It's okay, all right? We're moving forward and trying to do better. The question is, have you learned from your experiences, not did you fall down and get stuck with something? So key concept, you can learn to protect yourself. All right? So let's talk about what I will and won't do. First thing is that I can't guarantee anything. Like I said, there's always new scams that come up. And there are even things that are simply too involved to catch. I actually saw a story today about a guy said his father was buying a car, went to the dealership, picked out the car he wanted, and it was like a $60,000, $80,000 car or something like that. He would paid a deposit. He wanted to pay the balance. He had the money. So he emailed the salesperson. He had his business card and said, hey, where do I need to wire the rest of the money? The salesperson sent a response, then sent an email saying, oop, my bad, not that one, these. So the guy wired it off there. Somebody had hacked the salesperson's account and was looking for that, sent details to a different place somewhere else, and they were able to recover about $20,000 of the 40000 that he had wired, that kind of a thing. So there's no way to protect against that because you're going to trust that you've got the right people. We'll, we'll get into the, the hallmarks here, but that kind of thing, you, there's nothing that I can say or do that's going to prevent that from happening to you. You just have to get into some habits to avoid sort of taking the easy path. And again, we'll get into that. So we're not gonna make you an expert. That's not what this is about. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use the handouts here, and we're not gonna be referring to this though, through it goes, though the whole presentation is actually in here. So the first page, the trustworthy websites, these are websites that I've looked at. For the most part, they are government websites, big exception is Snopes and, and Reddit, but they are good resources to go look and understand things. The first one on here is through the Australian government. If you look at that URL, and if you don't know, Uniform Resource Locator, that's what the address is on here. See how it ends, .gov.au? That's an Australian government website. The US ones end in .gov, except of course for the post office, who's not on here, they're USPS.com. I actually remember when they had a .gov, they got rid of it, I don't know why, but. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you start having to pay attention to. What am I looking at? Where's something coming from? This Australian one is good because while their support and reporting suggestions are for Australia, they have a list that goes, what kind of scam are you dealing with? What's it about? What are you being asked to do? You click through and it will come out and describe what's going on. So it's a very nice way to go through and look at things. Again, reading about every single scam in the world is not going to make you an expert, but it will make you informed. And if you start seeing a pattern that shows up, you'll know, oh, that reminds me of this thing I saw. So preparing yourself that way is useful. Okay. Um, I describe all the URLs here. So I've got the, the USA ones. They're the, the USA scams and fraud ones is a shorter list. It's interested more about sort of government-related scam and fraud. You know, who are, who's masquerading as the government or things of that nature. Um, the FTC, the Federal Trade Commissions, they have their four steps. There's actually, I have that in, not the back, it's stupidly put it in the middle where it's hard to find. But you'll see this in the middle of your packet. Um, because, of course, the lovely handout, they intend you to purchase or order several handouts for things. It's not designed to print out on paper. But it talks about four key things you should be considering. So that is available on their website. 
There's a separate website for reporting fraud of various types through the FTC. So if you think you've encountered something that's suspicious, scammy, or you've been taken for money, you have a place you can go and report it to the government. AARP, not a government organization. It's a .org, it's just an organization. They also have some information which might be of interest. They tend to obviously focus on seniors. So you may see more things skewed that way. What are things that seniors are more likely to encounter? No one's gonna call a 20 year old and say, hey, your grandson just got arrested in Mexico. But they might call you, even if you don't have a grandson. We'll get to that. Um, I have Snopes mentioned on here because they rate some things as a scam. It's not a question of it's true or false. It's not real. It's, it's just an opportunity to take money. So there's a URL here for that. And then I have this big scams wiki index thing. That is the last third or so of this handout. Um, you will see a page like this says slash r slash scams. This is how subreddits or the communities on the Reddit social media platform are addressed. They have that name. And this one has a good index of different kinds of scams. Browsing through this to get an idea of what you're up against will be helpful to you. If you can go to it online, you can click the links to see because you'll have things like, oh, see here for a Wikipedia article about how this scam works, so you can get more details. All right. Just a couple other things that we'll be coming back to on this first page. Password Manager, this is a link to a review of password managers. I will explain what they are later, so we will get to that. And on the flip side, this is all double-sided, I talk about credit bureaus, because we're going to talk about protecting yourself financially as well, that's an important thing to do. All right, so we'll be coming back to that. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, the whole presentation is here. If you wanna take notes as I go through the slides, you're welcome to do so. But that is like the bulk of uh, this presentation. You get to the is it a scam? How to avoid scams handout by the FTC. There's an article here from Forbes that talks about financial scams to look out for this year. So that is something that they're talking about, things to pay more attention to, what might be hotter coming along. But again, it's kind of like predicting which strain of the flu is gonna come out. It's a bit of a guess, and it can shift suddenly. All right? Okay. So, and then the last, of course, is the R scam stuff. So, I am gonna show you examples of scams as we go through. I'm not gonna show you every scam on the planet because there's, they are legion. There's a bunch of them. I will use some to illustrate points. If you have questions, if something you've encountered is a scam, that's fine, you can raise your hand. But let me go through what's on here, again, you can, I don't want to stop you asking questions in the middle, but if you're waiting to see if I talk about something and I don't, bring it up at the end, because maybe I will midway through. And I am going to tell you about how I approach this sort of stuff. So most of what's coming out of here is a distillation of the kind of advice that you find online. The, the approaches I have seen talked about most commonly, how to cope with these things and the things that I've learned over the decades of dealing with IT and different questions, all right? Okay, so let's talk about some basics. What is it that scammers want? Anybody got a guess? <laughs> Money, exactly right. Oh yeah, how much? Want to guess? Yeah, all of it. <laughs> $10.3 billion for just internet scams, just in 2022, from an article I found that was mentioning an FBI report that came out in 2023. So for the year 2022, $10.3 billion in scams. All right, this is a big business thing. 
So paying attention to what you can do to not fall for them is going to be helpful for you, certainly. It might hurt them along the way, but that's okay. They can afford it. So let's talk about some of those scam approaches. First one that most people probably know about is email. If you don't have email, you're safe. You don't have to worry about this one. You may have email and not know it. It's possible that if you have, say, cable at home, that somebody set you up with an email address as part of being a cable subscriber. So that can happen. Now, if you don't read the email, you can't fall for the scam. So again, if you're not actively going and looking at things, you're going to be okay. But that is one approach that gets used. Another is text messages. If you have a smartphone, especially, text messages can be very compelling. Uh, there's a really popular one that was going around earlier this year. It's like, oh, this is the U.S. Post Office. There's a package coming to you. And click here because we don't have your address. We'll get to what that is and what you should be thinking about. But people react to that kind of stuff. So text messages can be very immediate. People want to respond to that. If you don't have a smartphone, if you don't have a cell phone of any kind, you're not getting messages, again, you, you can't fall for a scam you don't even see. It doesn't mean that you should be a total Luddite and go live on top of a tree or something like that. Nice view, but there's a lot of things you miss out on, like all this technology. Okay, social media, of course, is another big one. Facebook, right? I already mentioned Reddit. All the chat, chat applications that are out there, there's a lot of things that you can sort of innocently be doing, or the platform formerly known as Twitter, X, right? All of those kind of things can expose you to someone coming up and trying to interact with you in order to get money from you eventually. Of course, there's old school phone calls. That still happens. You still get them. There's one particular story I'm going to tell you about my mom in an old school phone call, so we'll, we'll get into that. And of course, there are in-person scams as well. I don't know how big that is compared to all the electronic stuff. I halfway wonder if we are a little more physically protected these days because the people who want to make money are doing it online because it's probably a better rate of return. So we will talk about all these different things and stuff that you can do to try and be aware of what's happening. Okay. So let's talk about some tactics that scammers use. And if I'm putting you to sleep, raise your hand and tell me, because I can shift things up a bit here. Um, the first particular thing that they're going to do is acquire information. They need to know your phone number or your email address. They need to know that you post somewhere. Maybe they need to know your name and address. Something, they have to get that information from somewhere. They may get other information as well. Now, where they get it from they might be able to get this information from you by talking to you. They might be able to get this information by purchasing data that was breached from something. I, I don't know that a big retail business like a credit card company or someplace like a Target, I don't think any of them has not had a data breach. We just may not find out about it right away. And all it takes, especially a credit card company, you know how I was in Japan earlier this year, and when you have your credit card, you go up and you pay, and the, your card is always there in front of you. Here in the U.S., you give your card to a waiter, and they take it away if you're at a table service restaurant. That's not how things work in other parts of the planet. They do the transaction there in front of you, which is a nice, secure feeling. But we used to worry about waiters copying down your credit card numbers. That's not the big concern. The big concern is the credit card company's database gets cracked or hacked or whatever you want to call it, and now there's millions of people's data that's available. Numbers, social security numbers, addresses, all that kind of good stuff. They've got it, and they'll sell it to other people who will then use it and try to get to you. All right? So they get information. Then they're going to try and create a situation. Those situations could be a problem. Oh, this is something that's your problem. You got to fix it, or you got to help me. I've got a problem, whatever it is. 
Or maybe it's a reward. Perhaps there is something that if you do this, you can make a lot of money. Hey, all you'd have to do is invest $100 and you'll get 10000 back. Sounds great, doesn't it? You know, that kind of thing. So you need to be aware of that. And we'll, again, we'll get into details. They will usually imply some kind of time pressure. Uh, this can actually work both to make you decide quickly or that they will take their time. We'll, we'll get into that. But usually there's some sense of if they can pressure you into thinking that time is of the essence, you are more likely to make a decision that will result in you losing money. Because if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, your IRS return didn't get accepted by the government, something happened, you've got a month to sort it out. Okay, you've got some time. You don't have to do anything right now. They say, we're sending the police to your house because you filed a fraudulent return, but if you spend us $500 in Target gift cards, we'll stop it. People fall for that kind of thing. So time pressure makes people stop thinking because they, they change their focus, all right? So be aware of that. And lastly, they're trying to control communication. If a scammer can do that, if they can get you talking only to them and not to anyone else, they control the story. So, yes, you are currently having a arrest warrant out for you because you filed a false IRS tax return. Well, if you actually hang up and call your accountant, that doesn't work, right? If they can keep you on the phone and keep you focused, boom. And I have seen many stories of people who work in retail saying, a guy came in, talking on the cell phone, went to the gift cards, got a bunch, came over, and we tried talking to him and saying, you gotta hang up, it's a scam. No one is going to accept that that's not how the government works, it's not how this works, you're fine. So if you only listen to the scammers, you're more likely to lose in this situation. You need to talk to other people. Mark, did you going to ask a question there? They still exist. So what Mark was asking about, for those watching at home, is skimmers, like on a gas station pump. You put your credit card in, and it reads the information off of it, as well as it going into the pump, so you think everything's working, but now that data's been collected, and later on the scammer can come and get that, or if they've got a Wi-Fi connection, they can download it while you're still at the pump, and then like Mark was saying, they'll take money out of your account before you even know it. So that kind of thing, that's one of those physical things, in-person situations, they're not even there. But you got to be mindful of those kinds of devices. Okay? Well, that's a good point. All right. So let's talk about what you're vulnerable about. What are your vulnerabilities? Not just because you go to this church or you live in the Midwest. This is just a human thing. So first off, you want to do the right thing. Somebody's challenging you or says something went wrong. You may have heard of things like there's, the, there's a little bit of a scam or a grift where you're trying to get change and the person who's making the change puts some money out or you know, and so in the end result, you end up giving them more money because there was a miscount in how it works. You're trying to be helpful and yet there's someone taking advantage of that. So that's a vulnerability. You trying to be helpful, trying to do the right thing, those can work against you, all right? It's not wrong. It doesn't mean you have to stop being a nice person. Just be mindful of that situation, 
all right? You also want to stay out of trouble. So if somebody comes up to you and says, oh, you're wanted by the police, or, hey, you dinged my car in the parking lot and I expect you to pay, you don't know who they are and you can't remember what happened, and you know that kind of thing, you're, you probably no, don't want to be in trouble, so you're going to be more likely to be involved and engage with that. You're also more likely to trust authority. I mean, it's the government, right? The government says, I haven't done something, then I should do that. Remember I mentioned the red light speeding thing? Oh, you ran a red light, here's your ticket. But we generally aren't thinking about things like, how would they know my cell phone number if I've never given it to them? We are an interconnected world, but are we really that interconnected? So let's start with an example. Let's talk about a scam I've already mentioned, which is the USPS message, your package can't be delivered. This was all the rage a few months ago. It seemed like it was happening every few days. I know I got it at least a half dozen times. And I'd already seen mention of it, so I knew what it was and was able to block it once it showed up. But this is what it looks like. So you see on here it says the USPS package has arrived at the warehouse and cannot be delivered due to incomplete address information. Please confirm your address in the link within 12 hours. Time pressure? Yes. Respect for authority? Post office. Okay. They give you a URL. It says USPS in it. Then we get this weird little thing. Please reply to Y, then exit the SMS, open the SMS activation link again, or copy the link to Safari browser and open it. Eh, whatever, it's technical stuff. The US Postal Team wishes you a wonderful day. Go Postal. But if you get this, and if you don't know to be concerned about these sorts of things, you might fall for this. What's going to happen? You're going to click that link. There's probably going to be something where you have to provide information. They may say, oh, there's postage due on your parcel. You've got to provide a credit card. Now you've given them your name, address, your credit card information. You're going to be losing some money, almost assuredly, right? And they can make that website look fairly convincing these days. It used to be they were really trashy, not so much anymore. So let's talk about some questions you should ask yourself if you encounter this kind of thing. So like one, how do they have your phone number but not your mailing address? Now I've sent a lot of packages to a lot of places and for the post office, they don't normally care about the phone number. You got the return address, you've got the, the addressee, the person it's going to, but you're not putting a phone number in. So how would they even have that information? They don't, right? So that's one thing. Are you even expecting a package? Did you order something? Is something coming? Was that something being delivered by the post office? I mean, if you order online from a place, they'll usually say, here's your shipping information. It's coming by UPS. That's not the post office. So you might be expecting a package, but eh. Or maybe someone in your family is sending you something by surprise. That would be nice, wouldn't it? We tend to want to trust what we're being told. So questioning this. Am I expecting something? Is this something that I should be doing? Uh, is this reasonable? You might at least get a little suspicious. And consider how many people really are waiting for a package. They get this message out of the blue. They think it's legitimate. If you know you're not expecting anything, you're more likely to dump it. But they only have to hit a few times to make enough money to keep this going. So, does the contact information make sense? What I'm getting at with that is, we'll, we'll talk about the link they gave in a moment, but every time I got this message myself, the phone number it came from was outside the United States. I don't think the post office utilizes other countries' phone systems to send me text messages. If you don't know that, if you don't know how to see on the phone number what that means, then your lack of awareness can work against you, right? You end up with what can you trust? Just the text that's in the message. If you don't understand where it's coming from and what that all means, 
you're not going to get suspicious. Another point, and we'll get to this one too, is, is the language consistent internally and with the organization? So, I don't know about you, but if I have to write something official, I'm going to be rewriting it, making sure it makes sense and reads properly and, and all that kind of stuff because I want the communication to be clear. But a lot of times these kind of things kind of jump around back and forth. And sometimes what's being said doesn't make sense with what the organization itself does. You know, it's like, you wouldn't get something, it's like we're sending cops to your house. You wouldn't get an official message saying that from the police department because they don't call themselves cops in official messages, they are police officers, right? It's not consistent. So those kind of things you need to pay attention to. So another thing to think about, what's happened in the past if you weren't home when a package showed up? You know, they'd leave a little slip or they would stick it somewhere on your porch or slip it behind the door or whatever. They don't text you. You've probably never had that happen where the post office sends you a text message. So let's look at that thing again. Now take a look at this. See if anything leaps out at you. Okay? Let's take a look at one. Warehouse. I lost a package that I shipped when I was in a business trip in Texas. I was shipping at home. And it was lost in a mail processing facility was not a warehouse. So to me, that's inconsistent. That doesn't sound right, doesn't fit. Please confirm your address in the link within 12 hours, or what's gonna happen? Is your package gonna melt? Will it explode? Are they gonna send it back to wherever it came from? We hear about dead litter offices. I mean, I know I've been on trips and things or there's a package and it's like, oh, it's just sitting in the local post office for however long. They don't the post office isn't going to panic after 12 hours of not being able to deliver a package, right? They'll keep it around for days or weeks or something. So again, it's not really consistent there, but you can see the time pressure they're doing. Okay, let's talk about this link. USPS, fine, dot trackfreight.us dot top, dot top, as you have seen from the handout, U.S. government defaults to .gov. Other countries, it's .gov, .whatever their country code is, okay? They don't use .top. If you don't know that, you won't pick up on it. Now you do. But that's the kind of thing, and what was funny, this link would change. Every message I ever got, it was a different link. They kept coming up with new ways because it doesn't take that long to create a website. You see it advertised all the time if you watch TV, like the Super Bowl, it seems everybody always has that. Oh, you can just create your website here. You watch a YouTube video. Oh, you can create your website with this place. And it doesn't take that long to get this kind of thing registered and set up and boom, there it is. So that's what's happening. Be suspicious if a link doesn't make sense. If you don't know if it doesn't make sense, ask someone. There are other people who know and will help. And then there's this one. Remember we talked about consistency of language? Please reply to why, then exit the SMS, et cetera, et cetera. That's a lot of stuff, okay? And it doesn't immediately make sense. It assumes you're using some kind of Apple device there's, there's a lot of weirdness in that. And again, that's not really how a government agency is going to this suddenly cryptic instructions like this. So if you were to respond with a why, you've now told them that your cell phone number works. You are a live prospect, an interacting human being. Your number is more valuable if they decide to sell it to someone else because they can guarantee it works. So if you get something like this, ignore it. Oh, and the last thing at the bottom, the U.S. Postal Team. The United States Post Office, right? Or everyone at the United States Post Office would, yeah, that I could buy, but the U.S. Postal Team? Sounds like they go bobsledding or something. <laughs> so, no. All right, so that's a scam. You get an idea of the kind of thing that you're up against and what it looks like. 
Let's take a look at another one. Now this one, there's no screenshots because this is a phone call type of situation. Someone is in trouble. Now the nature of that trouble, yet to be seen, you get a call, you answer it, and you find out that you're in trouble. Well, what you in trouble could be is several different things. Maybe it's a tax scam and they're saying, oh, your tax return is fraudulent or there's a problem or you owe us more money or something like that. Maybe it is, there's a warrant out for your arrest. That's cheerful news. You know, that's not going to make you have a good day to hear something like that. But I will also suggest as a sort of a warning here, the police do not call you to let you know you have a warrant. They just arrest you. <laughs> I've watched enough police body cam videos on YouTube to see that, oh, we pulled you over for this and we found out you have a warrant, so you're now being arrested. They don't give you five minutes to get away. Okay. So, but on the phone, someone says, hey, there's a warrant out for you and we're sending officers over there because you have to do this or you missed a court date or you were supposed to do jury duty and you didn't show up. They're not going to call you and tell you they have a warrant. Process server is another one that will come through like this. Now, I've never been served for this kind of thing. I know people, I know someone who was a process server and the idea is you're trying to get the person to hand them something. Here are the papers for you being sued. Here is your divorce decree that you didn't want to sign. You know, whatever it happens to be. They're not going to call you first so you're not around when they show up. That's not how they get their money. They have to give it to you in person. But they still try and do this sort of thing over the phone. So there's lots of ways in which the situation might be that you're in trouble. And when are you in trouble? It's not going to be next year. It's now. Right? Time pressure, and they've created a situation. So it could also be that someone else is in trouble. Maybe you've got a relative, someone in custody. Or there's apparently a Mexican prison scenario is a very common one. Yep, they were out at spring break, and they got arrested. They were on vacation, they got arrested. They accidentally somehow crossed the border and got arrested. You know, whatever weird situation it was. So... There's lots of variations on how this can work out. You get a phone call, someone's in trouble, it's you or someone else that you care about, and you gotta deal with that. Well, let me tell you what my mom's approach was to this. Your grandson's been arrested and needs money to make bail. She got this several years ago. So she said, oh no, I better call his parents, he's only one year old. <laughs> they hung up on her. So, my mom has a very no-nonsense kind of approach to that thing. I mention it later, but I'll say it here. Like, who here has ever had the, your car's extended warranty, we're trying to call about that kind of thing, right? She would get it, get a human being, and they'd say, we're calling about your extend, car's extended warranty. You'd go, oh, which car? They don't know, because that's not how the scam works. They don't actually know that much about you. And so her, she only has one car. But her saying, which car? puts the pressure on them to show up, and then they argue and then hang up, because she's not being cooperative, all right? So if you're getting a phone call that's challenging something, trying to set up a situation, some things to remember here. Remember what they're trying to do. They want to acquire information. Now, they may already have that. They may have your name. They've got your phone number. And maybe they may have a name of a family member, but sometimes they don't, like that Mexican prison one. It's like, oh. Your grandson's in jail, and then you say, Albert? And they go, yeah, it's Bertie, I'm stuck. Well, if you don't have a grandson, Albert, you've won. You know? So that's a little thing. We'll come back to that. But that sort of thing is what you've got to look out for here. They've created a situation. Someone's in trouble. They imply time pressure. There's something big going on here, and they want to keep you on the phone, they want to control that communication because if they can, if you don't talk to someone else, then you're fine. Suppose you have a relative and you get a phone call that suggests that that person is in jail and needs your help. They need to be bailed out. You don't know if this is true or not. Who does? The person they're talking about. Hang up. Because if it's really the police by chance calling, 
they'll probably call back. You're not just entitled to one phone call these days. They will, they will let you keep calling until you get to someone, right? But if by chance that person really is in jail, you call them up and you get no answer or something like that, um, again, I've seen enough police body cam, they take the person's phone with them to jail because they let them look it up. They don't let them make the call from that phone, but they let them look it up. So if the phone starts ringing with your name on it after they just tried to call you and you hung up, they'll probably figure that out, okay? But if you call them and say, no, I'm grocery shopping, you know they're not in jail in Mexico, all right? So if you can break their control on communication, you can talk to someone else, you can see, does this make sense? That will help you. Figure out who would know the answer and talk to them. Don't waste time, don't, don't guess, because there's nothing that tells you that the person on the phone is being honest. All right? So let's talk about those vulnerabilities of yours again. You want to do the right thing? See the problem there. You want to help someone who's stuck, yourself or someone else. You're trying to be friendly. You're trying to get things so people aren't in trouble. And you generally trust authorities. Someone comes up and saying, I'm with the police and you have this problem. Or I'm with the IRS and your taxes are due. You're more likely to engage with them. Stop. Hang up. Find out another way. We'll be coming back to those habit ideas. So let's actually start with that. Good habits. Yes. Right, and the question is, if you're doing something like ordering on Facebook, you see a pair of boots, how do you know it's a real thing and not a scam? You don't. Sometimes you can do things to protect yourself. Don't order with PayPal or with your credit cards. Credit cards generally have a protection thing so you can reverse a charge. You can dispute it and say, I didn't get this product, it didn't show up, okay? So there are things like that that you can do. Um, we'll talk about some other Facebook stuff. So. Let's keep moving through here. No, no, you're not. That, that's a perfectly good question, and it is the kind of thing to talk about. I have a whole section later on in here about selling and buying stuff and things to be concerned about. So we'll, we'll get into that. So good habits in general. First thing, you should ask someone you trust about what's going on, and a good person to ask is yourself. Here's the question to ask. Could this be a scam? Get into that habit. If you are thinking every time you have a situation, you know, boom, pair of boots, should I buy it? Or could it be a scam? Well, how can I find out if it's a scam? You might investigate the company. Do they really exist? You might see how long they've been around. You know, those kind of things. But even then, it can be hard to tell sometimes because Sometimes companies change. I just heard, you probably heard the news where Disney just fought off an attack by some kind of investor who wanted to run the parks really cheaply so they could get more profit out of the whole theme park thing. And they stopped it. But companies can change. Management can change. And they start changing their approach to things. So even though something may have been good before, it may not be so hot now. Ask some of the airlines what they think of Boeing airplanes these days. You know? All right, so another thing to be careful of, be vigilant, not smug. Like I said earlier, I'm not making you an expert with this handout and everything. You want to be aware of the risk that you might be scammed, that this might be a scam you are facing. You don't want to think that, oh, well, I've read this, I saw the presentation, I read the handout through front to back. You're not an expert, I'm not an expert. You don't know if something that's coming up might be something that wasn't covered in here. All right? So don't think you already know. Another point, assume your information will be leaked. 
I talked about it before with credit cards. Credit card companies get breached. Companies like Target get breached. They lose lots of data. That data is your data. And I think it's safer if you simply assume that information about you is going to get out. So you're not protected because you haven't personally ordered on Facebook or you haven't personally you know, interacted with chat online with somebody. They may get your information anyway. So there is a risk. Again, don't be smug, be vigilant. You do need to protect your personal information. So things like credit card numbers. There's, I've seen it too many times. Um, I think most of them have learned it. Here's one of those one that tends to be a scam that the kids fall for more than the adults. Kid gets their first credit card, so they take a picture of it Used to be when the numbers were on the front, they'd take the picture. They'd take a picture of it with all the numbers and they'd post it online. This happened so many times, it's insane. But they fall for it because they're not thinking, maybe I shouldn't take a picture of my credit card and post it online. To them, it's an achievement. And it is, but you don't celebrate it by sharing it with the world. Not that way. All right? So... You need to protect things like that. You need to protect things like, what's your birth date? Where do you live? How many kids do you have, if any? So try to be careful about what you share. We'll talk about that more when we get to social media. So another thing, we talked about how trusting authority is a vulnerability. Question authority. And this isn't the 1960s style down with things, but start off with don't trust someone who contacts you. Any call you receive, any email you receive, any text message you receive, any chat in an online thing, you don't know who it is until you've had a chance to investigate and figure it out. They are all on probation. Don't believe what they say. It may not be true. Now, it sounds kind of harsh, but what you are doing is trying to push the burden on them to prove who they are. So, Muriel sent me a text message and I didn't have her name, I just had the phone number. There was enough content, I was pretty sure that first message what it was about, but it was one of those things that kind of confirmed, okay? A lot of times it can be tricky. And like I said, this doesn't always work. Remember the guy who bought the car and lost his money because he got a second email saying, oh, nope, use these numbers instead. Right? So even if it is the right thing, it could still get wrong. But you got to make sure they are proving who they are. If someone, let's put it from this perspective. Let's suppose you call your bank because you're trying to find out why your debit card wasn't working in an ATM, making up something, all right? If you have called the number on your card and you get the regular bank thing and all that, you know who it is. They need to verify who you are, so they want you to enter your account number and enter your zip code or other sorts of things to try and confirm that, but okay. But if you get a phone call and they say, yeah, this is your bank, we're calling about problems with your credit card. Well, if they didn't say like the name of the bank, you definitely should be suspicious because U.S. banks are going to call you not going to call and say, yeah, this is your bank. They're going to say, this is so-and-so from U.S. Bank's fraud department. They'll say something like that. So you want to make sure they are proving themselves. And when you do hear, oh, I'm from here, I do this, verify it. It's like, oh, what's another way can I reach you? How do I reach you through the main number, all these other kind of things? Because I actually had a case. Holly and I had a situation where our checking account number got compromised. There were charges showing up for something. We didn't know what it was. We had no idea where it came from. And so I had to deal with the fraud department. They set up a new account, all this stuff. Well, right at that same time, I was getting text messages from someone who claimed to be a manager at a bank branch that wasn't the one I ever dealt with and saying, yeah, please contact me about this. And it's like, I have no idea who that is or what's going on. So I called the fraud department that I've been dealing with. I said, 
I was getting these messages. Can you check that? Is this a real person at the bank? And what do they want? Because I have no idea why they would call me. And they were able to look into it and figure out. And it turned out it was a manager and it was a confusing thing because of how different branches are assigned different accounts and things. It was weird. But I didn't know. So I checked the story. And I checked it not by talking to that person, but by going around. Okay? So it's like, if someone says, I'm the IRS, and you owe money, you hang up on them, and you call the IRS. Or you call your accountant, whatever it happens to be. Right? If somebody says, I'm with the police, and there's a warrant out for you, arrest. You hang up, you call the police department's non-emergency number, say, hey, I just had a call from someone saying that there's a warrant out for my arrest. I have no idea why. Can we check into this? They said they were officer so-and-so, and here's their number. And they go, yeah, that's not a number we use. No, there's no such officer like that. You're fine. You check independently. You go around. Okay? So that's the official paths. Especially when you get things like an email or a text message. They may give you a link. Don't click that link. You go a formal way. Like the post office one. Oh, I've got a package. I'm signed up for informed delivery with the post office. It tells me what mail I get. I get a mail digest every day saying, here's the mail that should show up today. And so I can log in there and see what packages are pending for me because it shows on that. So if I were to get that, I would just go check the actual post office website. It's an official path. All right? <clears throat> Do not trust a screenshot or an email. People can make up emails as coming from anywhere they want. It's called spoofing. So if somebody wants to have an email that looks like it comes from President Biden at whitehouse.gov, the email can get to you. All right? So as a matter of fact, I think there was a scam recently where it's Jill Biden, send me money to help do something to end hunger or something like that. It had nothing to do with Jill Biden or the government. It was a total scam. But you can't trust something coming through that way. Always go through official channels to figure out what's happening. Is this real? Is there something going on with that? Don't trust online reviews. So getting back to your story of the boots, how do I know this company's real? Well, even if you see 50 people saying, oh yeah, I bought these boots, they're great, they arrived quick and all this, are... you can't trust that. That could be the scammer and their fellow scammers creating all the accounts and doing all that sort of stuff. There's you don't know, it could be one person creating 50 accounts to post 50 different times. You can't tell. So don't trust online reviews. Even your Google Calendar can get spammed. People here use Google Calendar? I know I do. You get an email that says, hey, you have to be here at 6.30 on this date. It may show up on your calendar. Now, fortunately, things that are spam don't do that anymore. But that used to be a problem when people would see an event and they'd click it and open it and click links and say, mm -mm, don't trust that. All right, so question authority. Any questions on this? Okay. So, if you are looking at a company's website and you're looking at reviews of a product, A lot depends upon the company. So, for example, if you were to go out to REI uh, and look to see what people are posting there, people have to have a membership with REI, I think, in order to post a comment. Um, it's like, I subscribe to Cook's Illustrated magazine. People comment on the recipes online, but you have to be a subscriber to do that. Not just anyone can do it. You can't even see the recipe if you're not a subscriber. So it's a, it's a limited audience. It's when those things are wide open, Amazon, for example, that the reviews are suspicious. And if you have a company that is fraudulently selling stuff, they may create a website that has all sorts of reviews on it. You can't necessarily tell. So don't put yourself into a time pressure situation. Take the time to find out, is this company legitimate? Have they been around for a while? Do I know anyone else who's ordered from them? You know, all those kind of things. Because 
seeing reviews online might make you think, oh, this sounds like just the thing for me. But if you can't find other information elsewhere to confirm it, be suspicious. Suspicion is going to be kind of the key thing here. You just want to be, remember, vigilance, suspicion, always have that awareness. So with reviews, and we'll get to selling reviews later because that's another scam. Um, but with reviews, you can't tell. You really can't tell. Unless you're dealing with a closed community, people have to pay to get in, it's vetted, it's moderated, all those kind of things. If it's wide open like Google reviews, you have no idea. And I know one of the, uh, hold that thought, one of the subreddits on Reddit that I follow is called Tales from the Front Desk. It's hotel workers. And the things I have learned from watching those people talk back and forth is amazing. Um, how many times somebody comes in, stays for three days, comes out at the end of the day and they said, yeah, the hot water didn't work in our room the whole trip. Can we get this for free? It's like, why didn't you say something when you first found out? Well, we thought we could live with it. Well, no, you're not getting it because there's nothing we can do about it now. You missed your window for a refund. And then they go and they leave a one-star review on TripAdvisor or some other website like that complaining that the staff wasn't helpful and they refused to send anybody at all and they make up a completely different story than what they told the front desk. Usually the managers of those hotels are able to get in and delete fake reviews like that. But that's another example where the review isn't always trustworthy. You had a question. Mm -hmm. So, how, how do, is there someone to look at it to know? How can you tell if an email is legitimate? We'll talk about that more, but basically it's learning to look at what the email address is and looking specifically at that domain to see if it matches. So, for example, with Costco, you know you're going to Costco.com for their website. Their email is likely to be Costco.com. So, so-and-so at Costco.com or right. offers at Costco.com. Yeah. Right, and which is understandable. And you know, it's probably better to be out a hundred bucks than a hundred thousand, if you want to think about it in those terms. So that kind of stuff, yeah, it's and and that's part of the problem that you have here is that the legitimate businesses making offers that say act now for this can very often look exactly the same as the scammers telling you you got to do this now. And that makes your job harder. There's not a lot you can do, and it's probably safer to err on the side of caution if you can't really tell. Another thing you could do, though, is call your local Costco. Say, hey, I got an email that looks like this. Is this something you guys are actually sending out right now? Because they'll probably answer you and tell you, oh, yeah, this is what's happening. Here's how it works. Because you do get there are some companies that send out awful emails that looks like it's a scam, but it's not. They're just bad at communications. So, all right. So let's talk about securing your computer for a little bit here. And the basic answer to this is, this is a technical issue, so consult a technician. I don't have an answer for you. I don't know what kind of computer you got. I don't know what kind of network connectivity you've got, and all that sort of thing, so I can't tell you what to do. You should talk to the company who provides your network services. You should talk to someone who can support your computer, maybe the store where you bought it or maybe a store in town, like the Geek Squad at Best Buy, for example, will have advice for you on what to do. Or you might be able to find a class through some, used to be a time, I don't know if they still do it, but like the Science Museum in Minnesota used to offer computer classes on different topics. You can often find things like that that will answer those kinds of questions. How do I set this up, or who do I talk to, and, and that sort of thing. Because there are so many details of you know, oh, do you have a firewall? Is there a guest account on your computer? Are you sharing files automatically? Is, it, is, your, is there a password set on your network that you have at home? All those kind of things. And that's a technical thing. So securing your computer, you need to talk to somebody who can get on that computer, get on your network, and figure out what's going on. I'm sorry I can't help you with that. The people you need to talk to are the other folks I mentioned. All right, but we can talk about securing your accounts. 
who here has not heard of multi-factor authentication? Okay, so the idea behind multi-factor authentication is that instead of having just a username and a password for an account somewhere, there's also something else that you have to do. So for example, with Facebook, I've got it set up with multi-factor authentication so that if I log in on a new computer, I provide my username and my password, and then I have to give it a six-digit code that gets sent to my cell phone. So if it's not me, they don't have my cell phone, they can't get the code, they can't get in, even if they know my password, right? So multi-factor authentication, it's more information you're providing to log in. Question? Does face recognition count? It depends upon what you're doing. So your cell phone may have something like face recognition, but that's just access to your cell phone. Accounts that you have on the internet, so you have an account with Microsoft.com or Target.com because you order through there, or Instacart because you get your groceries delivered. If multi-factor authentication is offered for those accounts, it's not gonna use your phone's face recognition. They're going to have some other thing. It may be sending you an email with a code in it. It may be sending you a text message with a code in it. It may be calling you on a, on a voice phone and actually giving you a code number. So the, the facial recognition for your bank account is, is mainly a phone It depends on what you're set up with. So for example, um, with the bank app that I have on my phone, my phone's an older iPhone, it doesn't do any kind of face recognition. It only does fingerprints and numbers. So I can log into my bank app with the fingerprint once I logged in successfully the first time and say, yes, allow it to do fingerprints as well. If you have a newer phone that does faces, then it may let your face be the key to launch that app. But that's just on your phone, that's just locally on your phone, okay? You've got your phone, so you're good there. But if you had to go to a public library and look up something, maybe your phone got broken or lost and you're using something else, you may not have that set up. Multi-factor authentication is a way to get that extra validation that you are who you say you are. Because anybody who can get a password and a username can get to your account otherwise. If you, there's other information that you have to provide, that's helpful, that helps protect you. So look at places. Usually this shows up on a website. You'll find it under the account profile information. There may be security and passwords, but that's where you're going to be looking for it. Multi-factor authentication though is the official term, MFA. If you see that, look into that. Turning it on, it can be a pain in the neck that every time you get in, you have to do this. But it's secure. It's like my daughter's student loan, every time I have to go and make sure it's being paid, I have to go through this process. It's a pain in the neck, but it's more secure. And we're gonna talk more about passwords in a moment, so I'm gonna mention a couple things quickly here. One is, use a different random password for each account that you've got. You have any idea? I've got something like over 300 accounts because there's different sites that you go to. It's like, oh, I'm gonna sign into public radio today and look at something, or I'm going to Facebook, or I'm going to Reddit, or I have to go to the government because I have to renew my passport, or, you know. And any place you go and buy something if you set up an account, or like uh, hotels, I'm doing a lot of travel next week, so I was going to a lot of hotels. I sign up for the loyalty programs because I might as well get points. And so you build up all these accounts, right? You should have a different password for each account. That's insane, no one can remember that. We're gonna talk about that. Longer passwords are stronger than shorter ones. So a short little password that's got lots of weird stuff in it that you can barely remember, not as good as a much longer password, it's like a phrase. And we'll talk about that too. So, specifically, I remember when passwords used to be short. Eight characters was the password size. I actually, in high school, had a system, I think it was only six. And those days are long gone. You may encounter them in some places still, but that's, that's not how it was. As a result, they had to be cryptic. Your password was something like this. There, there's a password. This is the kind of password I'd recommend. I can always remember this password. I'll, 
I'll tell you how you can remember it and you'll never forget that. And you're never, not gonna use this because this is my example. Don't use this, okay? But I'm just gonna tell you how this is memorable. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. That was how I would recommend people do passwords 30 years ago. You need to set up a password somewhere, come up with a phrase that you know, take the first letter, upper and lower case, numbers, commas, and all that sort of stuff, use that as your password. Because it was cryptic, it had lots of different things in it, it was not gonna be an English word, so it was gonna be really hard for a computer to guess, it sounded great. That doesn't work anymore. We'll get into that. See, there's this website, a web comic called XKCD. You don't need to worry about what that stands for and everything, but they have a, uh, a comic about web passwords, and I want to show it to you because it's entertaining. This is what we used to tell people to do with passwords. Oh, you know, it can only be so long. Pick an English word and change out, make some things capital, lowercase, change some numbers and letters around so that you can figure that out, and maybe add something at the end. And so... It, these squares on here are all about, you know, oh, bits of data, bits of information, what do you got? Don't worry about that. The end result is that this kind of a password, if a computer can guess a thousand times a second, which they can easily do these days, just randomly trying stuff, it'll take them three days to crack that password. So cryptic isn't protection anymore. In the early days, it used to be you didn't want an English word, because you run a dictionary against a password account and eventually you'll find what that word is. Of course, a lot of people still use password as their password. <laughs> so if you're hacking into someone's account, there are certain things you try, right? Um, but so, yeah, that's not so hot. And of course, you have to try and remember it. So like, was it a trombone? No, troubadour. And there's a zero for an O and some symbol. Yeah, you don't remember it. If you don't write it down, which you should not do, right? You're stuck. So here's what we talk about now. This is what the suggestion that was made out from here. Pick four random words. Okay? And number of bits involved because the length of it is such that it would take 550 years at a thousand guesses a second. So at the same rate, it takes longer because it's so much longer. Now, we're not getting into scientific precision here. This is a web comic. It's illustrating a point through dramatizing this stuff. But this one is fun. You've already memorized it. Correct horse, battery staple. If you, and this is the thing I find now on websites, I have to pay attention to the maximum password length because I want to try and get it as long as possible. All right? But, if you've got words, it's easier to remember a sequence of words and have it make sense. But this raises the question, should you use correct horse battery staple as your password now that I've introduced you to this? No, do not do that. Because this has been on the internet for years. This is not a good password to use. But that concept of pick words, it's like, oh, I'm going to travel to Japan and meet my daughter in Nagoya. So it's like February, Nagoya, 2024. That's fairly longish, you know. I could throw in other things, change the order around in different ways. Easy for me to remember for the month that I have that password because I have to change mine every month. But I don't have to worry about other people guessing it because it's long enough to throw things off. Longer passwords are better. Now, remember how I said random passwords? Well, that... That makes life harder, but there's a way to deal with that. Use a password manager. And I already mentioned this in the handout. It's at the bottom of the front page. There's a link to a review of password managers. So what a password manager does is it will generate random passwords for you for every website that you need to set up an account. The genius of this is you know the password for the password manager, for what's called the password vault. That's what this is here. But you don't know what the actual passwords are for the individual accounts. Not that anyone's going to torture you for your Facebook password, right? But 
you, by having random passwords there, it does a couple things. For one thing, if somebody cracks your Facebook account, like they do a hack on Facebook and they get all the passwords, if you've used that password in every other account you have, well, now they can try your email and your password in common places like Microsoft.com, Target.com, US Bank, Wells Fargo, until they get a hit. So having different passwords on different accounts is better, and a password manager helps you do that. So I don't want to get dwell too long in the technical side of this. Here's the key concept. What a password manager will do is it will store your passwords on your computer, and then when you need it, it will provide that and log in. If it has to back up that information on the internet, it encrypts it before it sends it over the, the internet. So your passwords aren't exposed, all right? The nice thing about a password manager is you still have one password to log into the password manager, but then every other account can be random. And if something like Facebook gets hacked, you just come up with a new random password for Facebook, change it, you're done. The password manager remembers it. So Google Chrome has one built in, but that link talks about other ones, some free, some for purchase, that you can use and try and see what you think. It is worth your while. Yes, question. The disadvantage of using a password manager. The big disadvantage would be what happened to LastPass. Last year, two years ago, they actually had some kind of data breach that exposed user information and supposedly some user password vaults, supposedly. Uh, as a result, if you look at this article, this review, you'll see it. They decided we're not even going to look at LastPass and consider it this year. We'll see how they do in the next year, whether they're going to include them again. So you are almost literally putting all your eggs in one basket with a password manager. But you have to ask yourself, what's the bigger risk? Is it better to have an electronic password manager that backs things up, lets me generate random passwords, will check and see if I've used the same passwords in multiple places so I can go fix them, will alert me if a given site has been known to have a breach so I can go change the password right away? You know, there are features like that that are very nice. Or should I just get a little notebook that I keep next to the computer at home and I write everything in here and if the cat knocks a glass of water on it, it becomes illegible or it gets lost or burned up or someone throws it away because they thought it was ratty and, or someone steals it if they get into your house. What's the trade-off? What's a bigger risk to you? Keychain, um, so, Mac OS started off with that kind of stuff where you have that kind of thing where it will store additional information tied to your account that you log into your computer with. And it's essentially doing the same kind of thing. It's not a password manager per se, but it's linking into other services and things that you may use. So it's the same concept. It's a different application. But take a look at that password manager review because I strongly recommend that. Um, another thing, Password managers can often have secure notes, so a place where you can store information. And uh, for example, you may have a notes section for any account you set up. So if you decide that, uh, oh, you know, I wasn't born in Chicago for this place, I was born in Timbuktu. I can put that in the notes so I'll always know where I was born when I'm dealing with that company. We'll talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> Payment cards can be useful. You know, rather than having to type your credit card numbers in all the time, your password manager might be able to store it and then it can just plug it in for you when you need it. So if it's a secure enough place, there's a lot of value in having that. And it's a good way to manage your information these days. Yeah, forgetting your master password can be a downside. Um, <laughs> But that's, again, if there's one place where you want a memorable password that's fairly lengthy and all that, it's good. Even then, there's usually some sort of emergency backup way of doing it. But, yeah. If you, anytime you forget a password, you're going to be stuck. It's harder with password managers because they don't just say, oh, 
we'll reset your password for you, send us, you know, tell us your email. It's not that simple with something this complex and, and important. But, yeah, there, there's always a risk. Okay, so let's talk about another good habit here. Don't click that link. So many times you have a message of some sort and there's links in it or phone numbers or something and it's like, oh, it's a web address or, oh, there's a file or there's a phone number. If the message is suspicious, don't trust it. This used to be the most important thing that we would tell people decades ago. It's like, don't open a file if you don't know where it came from. It's still true. Only now, because of web addresses and phone numbers and using all these devices, don't, if it looks like a clickable link, don't just assume it's safe to click, all right? In an ideal world, you don't want to open it, like missing out on a $100 offer at Costco. Um, <laughs> if you don't know, if you're not certain, not opening it is the safest thing because it can't be influenced by something you're not looking at. And honestly, there was a period of time where people were using Microsoft Word as their reader for their Outlook mail and if your Outlook message had a file of a certain name in it, Word would automatically run that file. That was stupid, but that's what they had. And I don't think anyone ex exploited that. One guy made a demonstration of it to show this is stupid, you shouldn't do this. But that was a case where opening an email message actually could do harm to your computer. That's not supposed to happen. I'm old enough to remember when emails were safe. You could read an email all day. It wouldn't do anything to your computer. Not anymore. There's always concerns about this. Not as bad as it used to be because the companies have learned that maybe we shouldn't let people do anything they want. But any questions on this concept? Okay. So this gets back to questions. How do you know if it's a good email? Where does it come from? How can you tell? Look at domain names. So remember that USPS scam example earlier, how it had a dot top and this other weird stuff, you know, US dash freight, whatever. That's not the US government. That's not what it looks like. That's not how it functions. So let me tell you a little story. A friend of mine got into a romance scam several years ago. And when the scammer eventually tried to get money from her, he said, oh, I have a problem with DHL. They're holding back a big shipment I've got for my business. They need $3,428, some number he made up. And I told them my wife would pay it. Wasn't that sweet? He was so romantic. I told them my wife would pay it. I know that's kind of hard to deal with, but here's the email address of the CEO of DHL so you can write him and ask about this and how to take care of it. The email he gave was this. CEO manager 123 at yahoo.com. <laughs> now, this fortunately, and she had been telling me about this guy over time, nothing had seemed like a red flag until this day where all this just popped out of nowhere. That certainly was a red flag because there's no way DHL's executives are going to be using Yahoo email addresses, right? But consider, this was there because it had worked for enough people over enough times. Yes? And to clarify, the domain name is the Yahoo that you use. That's right. The yahoo.com is the domain name. It's user at site. That's how email addresses are built. User at site. So the site is that end bit. And there's usually a top level component. So at the, the smallest, it looks like this. Dot com, because it's a company in the US. Yahoo is the name of the company. That's their domain, yahoo.com. Other companies are similar. So like 3M is 3M.com or MMM.com, the stock symbol. They spun off Solventum, so there's a Solventum.com. They also use 3MHealth.com. I got that going. So there's domains usually are going to make sense that way. Domains from other countries may be .co.uk. It's a United Kingdom company. Right? Or like you saw on the handout, .gov.au, it's an Australian government thing. You can find videos on YouTube that explain domain names at 
talk about what the components are, what they mean, because there's a lot. There only used to be a handful. It used to be .com for companies, .edu for educational institutions, .mil for the military, .gov for the government. Now it's big. You've got all sorts of top-level domains for different sorts of things. And the different countries have their own little two-letter codes for things, like .uk, all right, .ie for Ireland, things like that. But that's the kind of thing that you need to pay attention to. And unfortunately, this may not show. If you're looking at an email, you may not see the address. You may see the name that's associated with the address, but this might not be so obvious. Sometimes you may have to hover over a name to see what the email is that it came through. The mail system you use, is, it depends on the mail system, which way you go to figure that out. So if you're not sure, you can ask someone who knows more about the mail system, how do I check this? Is there a way I can see what the actual email address is? And even then, email addresses can be spammed. I once sent an email to someone that was from the blob at the center dot of dot the earth, because there's a way to do that if you know how. A lot of that's been locked down in the last 30 years, but that capability is still there for systems that do mail. Okay, similar thing with phone numbers. So I mentioned before, phone numbers, you already know your area code, right? What's the US country code? Plus one. If you go to other countries, it's usually some two digit number that comes up in front and then the number of digits after might be longer. So when you get a text message, look at the number it's coming from. Is it a number you know? Should be in your contacts list, ideally. But if it's a longer number and it has a plus something at the beginning, it came from somewhere overseas. Chances that you're getting a text message from someone overseas? Yes. Right. Yeah. Scammers are much better these days at mimicking what looks like a real site. And you have to be careful with that. You can't always tell. So trying to go to the known entry points is good. Right. Um, as a side note, hotels, I've talked about that before. If you go and start looking for hotels, like, oh, I'm looking for the Marriott whatever in this, this town, the first hit you get guaranteed on Google Chrome is not going to be that hotel. It's going to be reservations.com because they have an advertising deal where any hotel searches will pop to them first because they want to be your travel agent and make you do your reservations through them. You have to pay attention to what's showing up and take a look at that, okay? So where things come from matters. Beware pin verification. So we, we talked about this before. Um, Multi-factor authentication is where when you log in, they send a number to your phone, your email, a text message, an actual voice phone call, something that you will have to provide to prove it's really you logging in. All right? If a scammer has figured out your account, they already know your username and password, they just can't log into your account because you got multi-factor authentication on, you might suddenly get something like this or say, oh, I need you to verify, prove who you are. I'm going to send you a number. Now, I want you to think for a moment. Imagine you're talking to a friend of yours on the phone and you're talking about how, yeah, I'm bringing over brownies for next week. And they say, well, I want you to prove who you are. I'm going to send you a six digit number. Does that make sense? Do real humans operate like that with other humans? No, that's how humans interact with computer systems. So somebody who's asking you to prove who you are by saying, give me this number that I'm sending you. That's a scam right there. Block it, report it, don't do it. Oftentimes on the message that you get, it will tell you this is your Yahoo reset or this is your Facebook 
pin verification. Do not share this with anyone. It's really obvious. People get fooled by it every day. All right? So beware of that kind of thing. They'll talk about sending you a number. It's a scam. If it happens to you, if somebody actually comes up to that and says, oh, I need this number, go change your passwords on those accounts where you got multi-factor authentication. Because, you know, I mean, if you get the number, it will be very clear. Oh, this is Yahoo. I need to go change my password there because somebody knows that much if they were able to get to this point. Okay? And this is something I alluded to earlier, strategic lying. Maybe too strong a term. Perhaps being a little bit more creative of what you're talking about. The idea is that you don't have to be honest for everyone with your additional information. So when I have to set up accounts in different places, oftentimes there may be something like, oh, you need to tell us what was your first car, or pick from this list of questions, and it's things like, what was the name of the school you went to for elementary school, or what city did you live in in fifth grade, or different little things like that. You don't have to tell them the truth. You can make it up. As long as you can consistently remember what you told them, you can make it up. Now, let me give one example that I hate, the mother's maiden name. This used to be big in the 90s. It seemed like the credit card companies and banks were getting, what's your mother's maiden name? For one thing, my mother's maiden name was Polish, and I didn't want to have to try and spell something that was a weird combination of consonants, okay? I know how to spell it, but it would just add to confusion if you're trying to tell someone over the phone, right? It wasn't Smith. So I ended up, I don't remember exactly what I put in there, but it was some kind of phrase like, who, who cares anymore, or who knows, something like that. <laughs> right? So that whenever they get it to that point in their thing, it's like, yeah, and I got that in your address, uh-huh, and uh, what's your mother's maiden name? I said, who knows? And they would take it, right? Because that's what I put in. You don't have to tell them the truth. Now, that always ticked me off. They don't do that anymore. Now you get more questions and, and choices to pick on, but that can be a useful thing to come up with something where like the question, sometimes you can even make up the question, so the question and the answer don't have to make any sense to any other human being. It could be, what's the worst way to eat sugar? With bamboo. Doesn't mean anything, but it would be a good validation thing, right? Because no one's going to know it. You're probably not going to share that in social media. Don't tell people about it. And please don't use the example I just use. Right? It's on YouTube. So... Another one that I hate, uh, this is the validation questions and answers. If you get to make up your own question, do so. Come up with something. It's like, why did it, question mark? Answer, 1492. Makes no sense. You know what it means. As long as you can consistently use that, it's helpful. If you use a password manager, you can store those answers in the notes with your password manager about that account. That way you can always get to it. Sometimes you do have to give real answers. Credit reporting. You have to tell them things like, you, when you're trying to verify you are the right person whose credit report needs maintaining, you have to tell them things like, what was your first car? Where did you live in this year? Things like that. You can't lie there. They know it. But for other stuff, like I had to set up uh, an account at a bank when I was a scout leader, and they needed to have verification, and it's like, in and what was your hometown? Dry Gulch, Hawaii. <laughs> and it's like, as far as I know, there is no such place. But if somebody asks me that at that institution, I give that answer, it's going to be me. Anybody who knows where I actually grew up, it's not going to be useful to them. Okay? Okay. So, let's talk about behaving online. Social media. This is when we talk about Facebook and all those other kind of fun things. Sharing is not caring, it's a security risk. Doesn't that sound nasty? So the idea here is we probably overshare on social media. The tendency is to want to share things. We want to celebrate things. My kids complain that all the pictures of them online are from me. 
Absolutely true. I don't think there's any pictures of them that they have put online. It's always things I've done for scouting or things on Facebook, like, oh, we all went out for Mother's Day. You know, so there's that information. What you should do is before you share something, think about it. Is this something I should share? For the most part, photos probably aren't a problem. We'll talk about AI at the end here. But generally speaking, you want to be careful about things that you're going to share, like are you going on a trip, for example? Um, it's one thing to say, we're planning a trip to New Zealand. It's another thing to say, we're going to be gone from this date to this date in September, because now anybody who might see your page would know that. Which means, if you want to share, how widely? Is it something for just family? Is it your close friends? Is it anybody who reads your page? Places like Facebook let you choose how widely that stuff is available. Pay attention to that and use those settings. I already mentioned travel. Ideally, talk about travel after you get back. Here are pictures from where we went. Remember I wasn't responding? Here's why I was over here. By doing it after the fact, you protect yourself. Now, if there's already going to be someone home, you have a house sitter, all these kind of things, that's good, but there's no reason in setting up those people for a possible home invasion because somebody thought you were gone. Excuse me. So you want to be careful about how much stuff you share. Another big thing with Facebook, those little cute surveys and name generator things. We've pro if you use Facebook, I can virtually guarantee you have seen this. It's the, oh, your pro wrestler name is the month of your birth and the year of your birth. And there's a list. And so you pick Ruby Knucklebuster. And now anybody who knows Ruby Knucklebuster can look at the list and say, oh, you were born in April of 1975. And it's like, you, you haven't hidden anything. You've just shared the month and year of your birth to anybody who looks at that. Those cute little things like that are dangerous for that reason. Another thing is there, there was one for a while that was going around. It was like, oh, here's a bunch of fun questions. It's just cool to share. I know some people will, some people won't. But if you're my friend, you will. Oh. And then it's something like, what was your first car you drove? Where were you born? And it's all the kinds of questions that you get when you're trying to identify yourself on like your credit report. Don't fill those in. Don't share that information with people. If you see somebody do that and you know who they are, tell them it's a bad idea to do that. You should delete that. Because you're sharing information about yourself you probably don't want other people to know. Okay. All right. So generally, be cautious. Now, I don't want to judge anyone here. And I'm not making assumptions about what you do or don't do. But it's important to mention this kind of thing. Don't share intimate photos of videos with people you don't know in person. Because as soon as you share something online, it's out of your control. If I have a physical picture, it's mine, nobody else has it. If I have a digital picture and I give it to you, you can give it to everyone else on the planet. There's nothing I can do to stop you. So I have to trust you an awful lot. Not that I'm giving you pictures, but you get the point. So now what counts as intimate and things like that? Maybe you don't want pictures of yourself swimming in your vault of gold, like uh, Scrooge McDuck. but Whatever it happens to be, be very careful with that kind of stuff. Because if it gets out, almost guaranteed someone will try to find a way to use it against you. Okay. If you get a message that looks suspicious when you're on social media, report it. All of a sudden, somebody sends you a friend request, and you look at their page, and it's nothing about how the cryptocurrency is great, and here's them in their mansion, and all that. It's a scam. Just block it, report it, go on with your life. Don't engage. Okay? You get a store where you don't get things, go back and report it. 
make it clear. Here's one that is really tricky, and I've seen people fall for this. Especially on Facebook, you get a friend request, and you think, oh, another friend. You approve it. You don't know who that person is. It might look like someone you know. It's another Holly Hugart. The picture's even the same. It's not her, because you're already her friend. Go check. What you want to do here is think first about these kind of things. Is this something, am I being asked to do something that I don't need to do? Where did this come from? Did Holly get rid of her account and is now back? What's happened there? Pay attention to that. Um, who here heard the story about how Ide Mill Road is going to be redeveloped? They're going to get rid of the neighborhood and put in an Amazon warehouse or a Walmart they hadn't decided yet? Anybody? see? I see some nods. So, but that came out on April 1st, right? So you knew what, this is silly. This is April 1st. On the internet, treat every day as if it is April 1st. That is the basics of it. Our tendency to trust what we see online, that, oh, it looks like a news site, so it must be news, that kind of thing. Don't do that. Question things. Double check. Verify. Find other sources. Talk to people over the phone. Things like that to try and confirm what you're finding out. Be suspicious. Be vigilant. All right? <laughs> Talking about this, can you even trust your friends? You can't trust anyone anymore. I need the crazy eyes. Too late? Oh, thank you. So, can you trust your friends? I still get emails from a data breach one of my friends had 10 years ago. Because somehow or other, their account got hacked for some mail system they used, and I was one of the email addresses they had saved. So I will periodically get an email that looks like it's coming from them, but it's not, and it's advertising something. It's like, oh, wow, here's something new I just found out. No, it's not. It's, it's a scam thing. Some link, someone's trying to get me to click a link and do something. Those things happen. You can trust your friends, but you cannot trust that something that says it's from your friend is from your friend. Verify. Double check. Ask them, hey, did you just send me an email? I actually had a work situation where I got an email that had no subject, no description, it was just a file. But it came from inside the company, and I knew who it came from. I treated that thing like it was kryptonite, because I had no clue what that was. I called them and I said, did you do this? Like, yeah, I forgot to, I hit the wrong button and so instead of saving a draft, it sent it. What is it? Oh, it's this file. It's this thing I wanted you to look at. It's like, okay. So I confirmed it through another means that it was a real thing and I could deal with it. But I was this close to deleting it because it looked really suspicious. Never mind that it came from inside the company. Thank you. So you want to do that. I already talked about getting friend invitations from somebody you already know. Double check that. Again, don't act without thinking. Think first, take a closer look if you can. And if it's suspicious, report it. Okay. Any questions on anything so far? I know this is a slog. I know there's a lot of information here, and I apologize. Mark, did you have a question? As far as I can tell, those are legitimate. Um, so what Mark was asking about are the things called or CAPTCHAs and various kind of are you a robot, check this box. And it has to do with the way that it's, it's amazing that we can build computers to do impressive things and they can't figure certain stuff out. Uh, what you probably have noticed in the last 10 to 15 years is a number of those things that say, click on everything that looks like a bicycle in this picture or click on everything that looks like a stoplight. You are training remote driving programs to be able to recognize that sort of stuff. 
That's what you are doing. So somebody's already vetted the picture, they're using it, but they're, they're getting that aggregate to figure out, ah, if a human thinks that this is a stoplight, then it's probably a stoplight. So it's not harmful to do that. You're still taking the time and doing things to demonstrate humanity. It's just really kind of bizarre. And the funny part is people have played with certain AI programs with those click this box, prove you're not a robot. They click it, get through, and it works just fine. So it's not that it's opening you up to a scam. It's that it may not be as effective as we thought it was. So I don't do web development, and that's not something I've had to cope with. But that particular kind of thing, especially in this day of chat GPT and things, and again, we'll get to AI at the end here, um, that is something that I think you need to be aware of. It, the validation part is not really the problem. It's kind of making sure that you're operating at a human speed when you're doing things on a web page instead of lickety split. So that's okay. But I don't think they, the people who built those things anticipated the other stuff other people were coming up with. So it's not really accomplishing what it used to anymore because if somebody wanted to, they could get around that. But yeah, it's an interesting, artificial intelligence can be a big area. Okay, self-defense, let's talk about smartphones. Wrong numbers. Remember what I talked about, your vulnerabilities? You wanna be helpful, you wanna be nice to people. Who here has gotten a wrong number recently, like in the last week or two? There's one, a couple, all right. You need to stop responding to wrong numbers. So here's why. If you are courteous and you have a wrong number and you want to sell, oh, this is a wrong number, what have you done? Especially if it's a text message, you've now proven someone responds to that number. It's a live number, there's a human there, you have now made your phone number more valuable on whatever black market of scammers networks that they've got, okay? So do not respond to those kind of things. And we're talking smartphones here. So if on your smartphone there's a call that comes in and you don't recognize the number, ignore it. Let it go to voicemail on its own. If they don't leave a message, it was a scam. I actually, I don't know if I have my outgoing message here, but generally if I have to advertise my number for some, like when I was a scout leader, I'd say, please leave a message so that I know what the call was about. If you leave it blank, I might block you. I would actually put that in my advertising I would have to send out. So if you get a call from a number you don't know and they don't leave a message, block it. If you get a call from a number you don't know and they leave a message saying, oh, hello, Dr. Smith, we wanted to talk to you about the horse that you saw yesterday. There was a question about the prescription. Please call us back. And you don't get any other, it's like, that's weird. It is weird. Wait. Don't respond. You're not Dr. Smith. You can't help them. If they really have your number wrong, they will call you again. I actually had a case like that recently. For some reason, I was getting a phone call from a vet down in Georgia. They had my number one digit off from the person they were actually trying to reach. But I was getting these messages, and it, made, it was consistent. And when I checked where it came from, it's like, yeah, that's an actual business, and it's this, and everything made sense. So I called them through their main number, rather than calling the number that called me, right? And I said, hey, I've been getting this at this number and I don't live in your state, so I don't know why I'm getting this. Maybe you got it for someone else. And we were able to clear it up. Don't respond to wrong messages. If it keeps coming back, then maybe. But you wanna be really careful on that sort of thing. So ignore text messages. They're not towards you. It's talking about, oh, you know, we're going to meet at the country club for lunch. Don't engage. Ignore it. Because what happens, a very common inroad on the scam world for that is, oh, I'm so sorry, my assistant must have made an error in putting in the number here. That's okay. What's your name? It's really nice to know you. Boy, maybe this is fate. Perhaps we should get together and talk about ways we can spend our money. Oh, you're not terribly wealthy. What would you like to be? Do you have some money to spare? You can invest in what I invest in. 
That's how those things go. So don't engage those things, all right? In fact, the federal government has a place where you can forward scam messages. If it looks like a scam, someone's asking you to click here to do something, you copy it and you send it to 7726, which spells out scam, and that's the FTC. They have that and they will record that and do things with it. What this means is you have a responsibility. Important numbers, your friends, companies you deal with, things like that, put it in your contacts list so that if you get a call, it's a known thing. You see a name that shows up. Ah, oh, that's my vet. Ah, oh, that's my mom. Ah, oh, that's my uncle, you know, whatever it is. That way, you know at least it's coming from that number. Someone, if someone scammed you, they at least went through the trouble to call you from a number that looks like someone you know. So you want to do that, you want to try and keep that up to date. If it's not familiar, let it go to voicemail and block anybody who doesn't leave a message. Okay? Now here's another one, which is probably even more important for us these days. Who knows where you are? So let's talk about that. You should have a trusted friend, someone you would trust with your location. You can, on your phone, share your location with them. What you share, on an iPhone it's called use Find My, on iPhones or Android you can just use Google Maps. You can share your location with that person. Now you have to make sure that it's set to share the location all the time. Not just when the app is being used, but anytime your phone is on. This does a couple things. First, if something happens to you, you go missing, or you lose your phone, you've got someone you can talk to who can find out where it is. That's very handy. The other side of it is, I want to tell you a story. The modern version of calling your neighbor every day. A lot of us may have grown up with this. My grandmother in West Virginia had a deal with her next door neighbor. Every day, her neighbor would call her at like 9 a.m., one ring, and hang up. And then she would call her neighbor back, one ring, and hang up. That was their ping. You there? I'm here. Okay. If anybody missed, the neighbor would go over and visit, right? Whoever didn't get the acknowledgement would go do something. My grandmother got a stroke one night. Next morning, her neighbor pinged her, didn't get a response, went over and checked, so she was only dealing with the stroke for less than a day before she got help. Not ideal, not as bad as it could have been. Sharing your location on your phone with someone you trust is a similar kind of thing. If your phone is often with you, that can be helpful. So, Think about people that you trust. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's some close friends that you can share this information with. If you go missing, they know, oh, go check up on that person. You can ping them back and forth with text messages these days. You don't have to call. But it is worth taking that approach, thinking in those terms. And we'll talk about some scams that come up here with this kind of thing. What are the problems if you do lose your phone? If you lost your phone and you have a location you don't know about, you might want the police to go with you. In other words, don't go alone. If your phone has been lost and somebody checks or you go on your computer and you see your phone says it's out in Frogtown and you've never been out in that section of Frogtown, you might want to go with someone at best, okay? Likewise, if someone shows up at your home insisting that their phone is in your house, tell them to bring the police over. You are not obliged to open your home to a stranger who claims that something of yours is inside. It can sound like the most friendly person in the world. They smile, a winning smile. It's like, oh, it says my phone's been in here, so can I just go check? Why would their phone be in your home? You know it's not. It's not like the elves came and brought the phone in, right? Mice aren't that strong. So 
you tell those people, I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. You're welcome to send a message that make it jingle or whatever. You know, find my iPhone will actually make it go and make loud noises and stuff. And then I'll listen, but you are not coming in. If you want to come in, you need to bring the police. You might, if you lose your phone, get scam messages too. Um, what can happen is this. If you ever want to experience just how much scammers pay attention to things like on Facebook, put a post on Facebook saying like, boy, I nearly lost my iPhone today. I guarantee you will probably have a half dozen comments on that from people you don't know saying, oh, I lost my iPhone once and I went and used this or I went and did here. I one time talked about how, ooh, I was dealing with some scam posts on something on Reddit and saw all that. And then I got a lot of people saying, oh, my account got compromised. Here's how I fixed it. I had like 30 of those things. There are programs monitoring what happens out there. If you're posting in the public and you hit one of their keywords, they will respond. It won't make any sense because it's a canned response. It's not an actual human doing it. But you got to be careful. If you lose your iPhone, you will trigger that same sort of thing. People offering to help you with it or other sorts of things. You also might be told to disconnect the phone. For iPhones in particular, they can be linked to an account so that you can go to a computer that's also linked to that account and say, I lost my iPhone, lock it. That way nobody can get into it. If your phone was stolen, somebody might try to get in touch with you and say, would you remove this from your iCloud account so it can be used again? Don't do that. Don't do that. You can erase your phone remotely. That's a good way to deal with it because when you do that, your carrier, and you may have to report to your carrier on this, but they can also block your phone from even working. So spoil it for the thief if that's what's happened. But those are things that you should be aware of. Okay. Yes. Are we hitting our limits? You know, it would probably be good to stop at this point and we can hit up another time or people can look on because there's still a lot of stuff. We can come back another time because at the moment I'm on slide 43 out of 89, so halfway. And it, it is, this is the problem that I faced when I was trying to pull this together because think about all the stuff I've told you so far, what subset of that would you need to know and feel that you know something? If I just told you, don't let yourself be time pressured, I mean, that's useful, but it's not enough. There's still a lot of other things. We haven't even talked about romance scams, really. That's a big issue. So, um, Let's meet again and go over this some more. Worst thing is we have an excuse to have another potluck. I could make it this time. Yeah, no, it'd be good to have some physical movement. We gotta, we gotta do a combination of Pilates and presentation. So. We can, yeah, find another time. We can keep going on with stuff because, and again, read what's in there, thumb through. If you look at the list of scams, you'll get an idea of just how much is out there. We've only given you a taste of what there is, but there's a lot. There's a lot to do. All right. Thank you so much. Sure.